Du hai ras! It's kind of depressing that it took seven episodes for things to feel as epic as they did in season one. But House of the Dragon finally got there. The Red Sewing lived up to its name, no matter how small its scope was compared to the actual book event. Most of episode seven was focused on this one gamble that Rhaenyra thinks will be her only path to peace. At the start of the episode, she thought that Cyrax was her only large dragon. By its end, she has three more on her side, not counting Caraxes, Vermax, or Moon Dancer. The Greens have officially been put on notice, and for the first time, we see Amon back away from a fight. But we also see other things that are rather different from the source material in this episode, and we are going to talk about 10 of them. So, without further ado, Put on your spoiler hats because things might get messier than usual. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. What is your name? Adam of Hull. Rhaenyra. Adam and an army of best. The episode begins with the consequences of what happened at the end of the last episode. No, not the kiss between Rhaenyra and Missaria. The news that Sea Smoke had taken a new rider. The Black Queen faces this new rider at the break of dawn, and he turns out to be none other than Adam of Hall. He does the smart thing and bends the knee to her, pledging his loyalty and dragon to her cause. But this changes the course of the sewing for the show. Up until this point, Rhaenyra had believed that Targaryen blood was crucial to mastering dragons, but she was only looking at nobility because they were easier to control. Also, it was easier to track down nobles. Commoners don't keep family annals, as Adam informed Rhaenyra during their brief exchange. He also tells her that his mother was a shipwright, and his father was a no one of consequence. He holds a grudge against Corlys for ignoring him while lavishing praise and attention on Alan. But as it turns out, it isn't the Sea Snake's lineage that gave him the dragon's blood. Later, in the episode, we see Corlys and Alan discussing the heritage of his mother, who still hasn't been named on the show, but is called Marilda in the books. The way Corlys frames it, Marilda could have been the one with Targaryen blood, because the generation before Rhaenyra's was rather raunchy. We've already seen Viserys and Daemon discussing their revels in season one, and if Ulf's story is true, then their dad was the same way. We also learned that Hugh Hammer's mother is apparently Sarah Targaryen, the most hated and loved daughter of King Jaehaerys. So he does have a larger concentration of Targaryen blood than Stefan Darkland. If Adam's mother is a dragon seed, then all of Rhaenyra's new dragon riders have more Targaryen blood than the former Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard. The show gives Missaria Mushroom's line about looking under the sheets and woodpiles for dragon seeds if bastards and lowborn people are also game. And Rhaenyra replies by saying they need to raise an army of bastards. Her decision proves controversial, as the dragon keepers refuse to take part in such a breaking of tradition. And Adam's achievement itself occurs out of contact. In the book, it was part of the larger sewing, where dozens of bastards and regular men were also involved. In the show, he becomes the catalyst for their involvement. It's just too sad, then, that his brother doesn't share his opinion. I am of salt and sea. I yearn for nothing else. Ellen doesn't try to claim a dragon. In Fire and Blood, both Adam and Ellen looked like model Valyrian, and both Adam and Ellen attempted to claim dragons. Adam clearly succeeded, but Ellen did not. He was a smart alike that looked for Grey Ghost first, because he knew it was the shyest of them all. When he couldn't find it, he went after Sheep Stealer, and that turned out to be a disaster. Sheep Stealer rejected Alin and set his cloak aflame, and Adam had to save his brother with sea smoke, lest he turned into dragon food. He managed to put out the fire, but Alan's body remained scarred forever after. His attempt itself was proof of his dragon blood, and soon after the sowing, Corlys had both both his sons legitimized. In House of the Dragon, Alan has no desire to repeat his brother's achievement because, as he says, he's of salt and sea. The Oaken Fist will be remembered for his exploits at sea instead of Dragonback. And, you know, just as well, for he would be the last Valerian of any note. But the reason that they had him reject the opportunity to become a dragon rider in the show 
is because they needed to follow through on the matter of Driftmark's inheritance. Salt and Sea is a phrase that has been associated with the Driftwood throne all season long, starting with Bela, who rejected Corliss's offer because she is a Targaryen, and ending with Ellen, who will accept it because he's a Valerian. Ultimately, Ellen's attempt to claim a dragon only leaves him with scars in the book, so it isn't too massive of a change. But it's what it implies that matters. Him proclaiming himself of salt and sea is what will make the light bulb go off in Corliss's head and give him the idea to finally start being a father to his children, starting with his new heir. And speaking of people taking responsibility of their messes, So Grace, I've been faithful. The Muppet with a set. Damon finally does something right. When we first met Oscar Tully, we felt bad for the kid. He was being bullied into potentially poisoning his own grandfather by Dama, and was dismissed when he refused to acquiesce the prince's demand. Willem Blackwood listened and took advantage of it by laying waste to the Riverlands with his riders. He claimed the crown's authority in doing so, and he believed Damon would protect him. Hell, he might have, had he not been utterly unmanned by a teenager. Because the Oscar Tully we see in this episode is nothing like the one we saw in episode 4. The Lord Paramount of the Riverlands makes justice his first order of business, and though he did not inherit his grandfather's allegiances, he did inherit his wit. Within the span of a few minutes, he manages to relay to Daemon the fact that without him, his entire show in the Riverlands would be for nothing. He'd be isolated from his actual queen, and not even Caraxes would be enough to preserve his claim. Oscar proceeds to address his bannerman's accusations regarding Willem Blackwood's actions, and without lifting so much as a finger, performs a miracle. This young boy gets Daemon Targaryen to repent for his stakes and do the right thing. When Lady from House Malister demands that justice be done the old way, Daemon uses Dark Sister to behead Willem Blackwood for his crime. He thought he'd be getting a pliable little kid in his new Lord Paramount, but the Oscar Tully that returned from River Run was a man. He cleverly kept his elf to Rhaenyra whilst disarming Daemon's solutions of being king. He reminded him that the armies of the Riverlands were under his direct authority, not Daemon's, and he himself was a prince, not a king consort. With Willem out of the way, we finally have room in the series for the arrival of young Benjicott Blackwood, and the foundation for the lad's disappearance all set. Kermit might not be joining this part, but with Ruddy Oscar and Bloody Ben on the same side, the River Lords will finally get a chance to show just how useful they can be in a war. And, you know, Daemon did the right thing, so that's cool too. I'm no fool, mother. The proof is here for all to see. Jace is going in the opposite direction to his book character, but where Oscar Tully is coming into his own as a great lord, Prince Jaceris is losing faith in his position day after day. Jace has always struggled to believe that he was a true Targaryen ever since he found out about his mother's affair with Harwin Strong. He doesn't hate either of them for it, but it has made him question his own legitimacy and worthiness on more than one occasion. Jace thought that his dragon and those of his brothers would prove their legitimacy in the eyes of God and men. But when Adam claimed sea smoke, that hope vanished into thin air. Jace knows that by allowing bastards and baseborn people, his mother might expose his heritage, and maybe he puts it across in a rather classist way. But, you know, he's hurting. He wants to be useful, but can't be. He's never told anything. His mother trusts Miseria more than her blood, and now she wants to give dragons to bastards, thereby proving he's a bastard himself for him to take in. Especially when in the books, he was the one who was supposed to be running all this. Fire and Blood tells us that Prince Jaceris was the one that put out the call for Dragon Seed, that he was the one who offered lands and riches, and he was the one who consolidated his dragon riders after they were found. All those things were done by Rhaenyra in the show, which has only pushed Jace further and further away from her. For a person that claims to want the best for her people, Rhaenyra can be blissfully ignorant to what's best for her family and has a way of conveying the right things that always makes her seem wrong. At this point in the books, Jace was supposed to be shoring up Dragonstone's defenses in anticipation of a blockade break, but the show might make that scene more impulsive. You know, based on his character trajectory, he's feeling the pressure and the need to prove himself worthy. And those two things, when put together, are a recipe for disaster, especially when dragons are involved. We just hope he is as good as he thinks he is.
the exodus from King's Landing. Finding dragon riders of noble birth is difficult enough as it is, and one that would remain loyal? More so. But at least this approach makes more military sense than Jace's open call for dragon riders from the books. House of the Dragon has made a big deal of Rhaenyra's search for dragon riders and also altered many details from Fire and Blood, especially with respect to where its participants come from. There, the dragon seeds come from Dragonstone and Driftmark because the Valeran blockade was in full effect and King's Landing's defenses weren't a joke. Seriously, we've had both Daemon and Rhaenyra enter and exit the capital in Season 2, which makes the Greens look like absolute chumps. Elinda Massey sneaking into the city was a lot more believable, considering guards would barely recall her face. But then, Alan Valerian shows up and leads a friggin' exodus from the city in Episode 7. And this is where we have to question House Hightower's vigilance, which, ironically enough, is the name of their ancestral sword. Turns out, sleeping on the job is part of being vigilant, because somehow, Rhaenyra and Missaria are able to smuggle nearly four score Targaryen bastards from King's Landing to Dragonstone. Island is much smaller with show, so the possibility of keeping things realistic and having many bastards come from it were low as it is. The pleasure house angle is a bit harder to stomach, considering how good and noble the last three generations of Targaryens were depicted as being, but not entirely impossible. Hugh and Ulf being from King's Landing because their parents were Targaryen royalty makes a lot more sense than them being random blacksmiths and men-at-arms that somehow gain control over dragons. Still, as good as this plan was, it was entirely new, and one of the biggest changes from the book to the show. We're not even sure Amon knows what's been happening under his nose all this time, and we hope for his sake that that changes next episode, because frankly, the Greens can use a win right about now. Reyna rushes to find Sheep Stealer. We'll keep this one short because we've addressed it before, but it looks like this particular leak about House of the Dragon is a true one. Though we did spot a girl matching Nettle's description leaving King's Landing with Nettle's in her hair while the exodus was happening. We're no longer sure she will be of any relevance. That's because House of the Dragon has made it clear that Sheep Stealer will have some sort of relationship with Reyna. The wild dragon has been burning and eating sheep in the Vale for a few months, and while that is consistent with how dragons behave in Martin's world, it makes sense in that the Vale has a lot of sheep. Instead of staying at the Eyrie and holding court with Lady Jane Arryn, Reyna is being packed off to Pento to raise her half-brothers. Episode 7 saw Jane bid her farewell as Reyna, Aegon, and Viserys started their journey to Gulltown to board the Gay Abandon. As you might have noticed from the beginning of the season, the Lady of the Vale and the Princess have a bit of a rocky relationship. Jane doesn't even wait to see her charges climb down the hill and disappear to the land. She closes the doors behind herself as soon as Reyna is out of earshot, and the Princess takes this opportunity opportunity to run off to her own adventure, Reyna has begun tracking Sheep Stealer by following the trail of his kill site, and soon enough, she will have him cornered. The question then becomes how she plans on bonding with because when she was 14, she tried bonding with Seasmith, and that ended in disaster. Reyna was nearly killed by her uncle's dragon and Sheep Stealer is easily twice its size. She might take a page out of Nettle's playbook and trick it with sheep, but she's going solo on this one, and we don't think her herding skills are up to the mark. Either way, it does look like Reyna will be bonding with Sheep Stealer instead of mourning, which is already a massive change from book canon. And speaking of Sheep Stealer being swapped in for other dragons, Vermifor replaces all riderless dragons in effect. The red sowing was truly a bloody affair, because while the small folk Rhaenyra had gathered were aware of the risk they were taking, they didn't truly grasp it. When the dragon keepers refused to join her mission, Rhaenyra summoned Vermithor and prepared him for a new rider herself. Turns out, reading books comes in handy and all her poring over ancient Valyrian scrolls paid off in that moment. Rhaenyra stood steadfast on her decision to let the commoners prove themselves, even if things went wrong, and you know, this paid off too. 
However, we were slightly disappointed that the only dragon that actually partook in the sowing was Vermithor. In Fire and Blood, six wild dragons are up for grabs. And, you know, like it or not, people try to claim all of them. Sea Smoke is claimed by Adam of Hull after he kills Stefan Darklin pretty soon into the sowing. But the rest take time and a lot of sacrifice. Alan goes looking for Grey Ghost, but never finds him. Sea Smoke kills Dragon Seeds aplenty before Adam gets him, instead of choosing him at Driftmark. Silver Ring remains docile across both iterations of the sowing, but Sheep Stealer's role is given to Vermithor. It is said that during the Red Sowing, Sheep Stealer killed more potential dragon riders than Vermithor, Sea Smoke, Grey Ghost, Silver Ring, and Cannibal combined. Two of those dragons didn't even harm people. People, and the other three did, but clearly, the numbers were low enough for Sheep Stealer to emerge the fiercest dragon of them all. House of the Dragon decided to lean into Vermithor's moniker and unleash the bronze fury upon the dragon sea, merging all their death and glory into one compound event. No other dragon will have a kill count like his, because he effectively kills all dragon seeds present. The few that survive escape with their lives barely in their hands. The bronze fury is ultimately brought to heal by the courage of Hugh Hammer, and that much is consistent with the books. But the rest of the event's deaths were supposed to be spread across many dragons, and not just the Bronze Fury. For instance, the one we're about to discuss. Silver Dennis is killed by Vermithor. The show has made the concentration of Targaryen blood a focal point of the Dragon Bond. All the riders that claim dragons in Episode 7 have a close or direct ancestor with Targaryen blood. Ulf White claims to be the son of Balon Targaryen, the father of Viserys and Daemon. Hugh claims to be the son of Sarah Targaryen, the younger sister of Balon. Adam's father is Corlys, and his mother, Marilda, must be the dragons in that equation. But, you know, here's the thing. None of their parents are even remotely discussed fire and blood. Of the named dragon seeds that partake in the sowing in the books, only one claims to be descended from Targaryen royalty and is aware of his supposed lineage. That man is the one who steps forward when Rhaenyra asks who want to go first in the show, Silver Dennis. In the book, Dennis claims to be the offspring of a bastard son of Maegor Targaryen. In an earlier version of the story, he claimed to be the bastard of Maegor himself, but that wouldn't made him 80 years old at least, so Martin changed it to him being a bastard of a bastard. Dennis brought his sons with him when he tried to claim Sheep Stealer and Fire and Blood, but the dragon tore off his arm and rejected him and his sons as potential riders. The good thing is Dennis isn't maimed like that in the show. The bad thing is he is killed outright by none other than Vermithor. Robert Rhodes doesn't even get lines in his portrayal of this infamous Targaryen bastard before he and his supposed sons eat a face full of dragon flame. Dennis's death coming at the hands of Vermifer is a change from his attempt to claim Sheep Stealer, but his actual death itself was supposed to have come at the hands of an entirely different dragon, who seems to have been written out of the show altogether. The cannibal is absent entirely. There is hope yet for Grey Ghost to show up in season 3, considering he's going to be part of one of the most pivotal riderless dragon fights in the entire series. But when it comes to the cannibal, we're not sure we're ever going to see him. At the beginning of Season 2, we'd presume that they would make changes to the pattern of the sewing, but would include or at least show us all the prospective dragons involved at the very least. Instead, they kept it restricted to Silverwing and Vermithor, and we didn't get to see any of the wild dragons. We know Sheep Stealer exists thanks to the trail of evidence he's leaving behind in the Vale, and we might even see him next episode. But we're not sure we will ever see the cannibal, especially after Vermithor stole his kill. In Fire and Blood, Sheep Stealer tears off Silver Dennis's arm, but doesn't finish the job for some reason. Perhaps he loses interest, or perhaps Dennis's son brings him to safety. Because they were trying their best to staunch his wounds when a nightmare black as coal descended on them. The cannibal arrived, drove off Sheep Stealer, and proceeded to kill and devour Silver Dennis and his son. This was the only time he made his presence felt during the sowing because no one was foolish enough to try to claim him. Any who were, weren't heard from again, and neither was Dennis and his family of bastards. The cannibal is only involved in two other incidents, and his presence in them is adjacent at best, so it looks like we're not going to see Balerion's rival anytime soon, if at all. Crazier things are being attempted by the show. However, we won't be surprised if he does fly out to salute a main character's death at the end of the series, even though he's in a Targaryen. 
It's a shame that we didn't get to see the cannibal in all his glory, but we understand budget is a concern, and we loved Vermithor living up to his nickname anyway. Also, the way the show ended the sewing was way more satisfactory, because Alf's drunken joyride as a warning shot. Towards the end of the episode, we get an update on the movements of the Greens in the Reach when the defenders of the Red Keep start screaming about a dragon. At first, the Green Council ignores it because at the start of Season 2, they'd become paranoid over Vagar arriving to the city, so they chalked it up to paranoia. But when they heard the warning calls continue, Amon went outside to take a look at what was causing the commotion and found a dragon that wasn't his. After accidentally stumbling into Silverwing's lair within the dragon mount and bonding with her on account of being a direct descendant of her first rider, Ulf is sent out to King's Landing by Rhaenyra as a reward and a warning. Actually, you can clearly tell that this is Ulf's first time flying, as he barely holds on to Silverwing's saddle. But the more time he spends in the air, the better he gets at handling her. And besides, he was sent there as a warning. As soon as Amon realizes that the identity of the dragon is within a city, he makes haste for Vagar, who is resting outside its walls. He flies the great dragon in pursuit of Ulf, and at first, he must have thought that he would get to fight him like he fought Luke. He flew over the Valerian blockade and was deep into the gullet when he realized he was being trapped. Silverwing returned to Dragonstone, and when Amon caught sight of the island, he glimpsed not one dragon, but free, waiting to welcome him. He turns Vagar around and actually uses the word flee in his commands. But this entire sequence, which was intended as a taunt from Rhaenyra to Aemon, is an original one conceived solely for the TV show. In House of the Dragon, she is eager to have a quick bloodless victory, and she thinks with her new riders and dragons, she can force Aemon to submit. He clearly knows he's lost his dragon advantage with Vermithor entering the fray, and, you know, in the books, an entire battle needed to be fought before Rhaenyra even thought of going to King's Landing. In the show, she has decided to make that her first priority, because she knows that if she captures the throne, the rest of the realm should follow. We don't know if projecting her plans to her enemy like this was a power move or a stupid one, considering she's only made Aemon angrier, but that remains to be seen. As for Ulf, we hope he enjoyed his first flight on his alleged grandmother's dragon, because he will only get that opportunity so many times. Marvelous Verdict. And that's it for the differences between the penultimate episode of House of the Dragon Season 2 and Fire and Blood. It's refreshing to see one plot point get a featured spotlight throughout the episode, because for most of its lifetime, House of the Dragon has been a mad scramble to put together all the different plots and have them make sense. But now that we've addressed the biggest differences from book to show, we'd like to know what you guys think. Let us know in the comments section down below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe as we reach the end of the dragon season. We'll see you guys in the next one. And don't forget, history is written in fire and blood.